breach of contract, existence of a contract, breach of breach of the contract, and damages resulting from the breach. What uh, what could be simpler? Actually, there are many pitfalls for the unwary in breach of contract cases. First, a contract must be enforceable at law to provide the basis for a suit. Many contracts aren't. For example, a contract in contemplation of marriage, ergo, Harriet tells Harry uh, she will give him the uh, him title to her farm if he will marry her. Excuse me, it's not enforceable in most jurisdictions today. Con that's the old fucking you get for the fucking you got there, Harry. Uh, contracts for the sale of uh, valued at more than 500 cannot be enforced in most jurisdictions today unless committed to in writing. Now, that is a very important subject matter. I would say all contracts should be in written form, ladies and gentlemen. I don't care if it's for $5 or compelled performance. You know, I, I trade you a candy bar. You you always want it in writing, needless to say. is not enforceable in most jurisdictions today. Contracts for the sales of goods valued at more than 500 cannot be enforced in most jurisdictions today unless committed to and and contracts uh, for the performance of services that cannot be performed in the space of one year are only enforceable if committed to a uh, committed to a writing signed by the defendant. So the first uh, prerequisite is that the contract be in. So in other words, when you draw up the contract, make sure that it states that it is enforceable at law. Okay. And everybody's been duly informed that this is an enforceable contract at law in the local jurisdiction of the courts, wherever the contract was consummated. Second, the breach must be committed without justification. For example, if Tom promises to deliver 75 bushels of apples to Bill on Tuesday for $25 and Tom shows up a day late with the apples, Bill has no obligation to pay and Tom has no cause of action for breach of contract. Tom breached first. Finally, that's called commercial dishonor, ladies and gentlemen. I got a judge on that one time. It was kind of a knee slapper. It was fun to just screw with them a little bit because they thought they were going to pull the wool over my eyes. And I said, hey, what guarantee do I have that you'll be here? Because you're the one that breached the contract after all in the first place. You're in breach of trust. You're in commercial dishonor. Okay, you're breaching your fiduciary duty. You had a time to be here. You're the one, after all, that set the matter for a hearing or set the matter for trial and wanted to be here at a certain time. You weren't here. You're the one on the hook, not me. Okay. Finally, damages suffered must be a direct result of the breach. Consequent, uh, consequential or uh, incidental damages are ordinarily not revoke, uh, recoverable. The most famous example is the case of uh, Hadley versus Baxendale, B-A-X-E-N-D-A-L-E, -E, an English an English case in the court of Ex Exchequer, 1854, brought by a mill owner against a mill wheel crafts. Uh, crankshaft repairman. The learned judge wrote in the opinion, after reviewing the jury verdict against the mill owner, Hadley, we think that the, there ought to be a new trial in this case, trial de novo, but in so doing, we deem it to be uh, expedient and necessary to state explicitly the rules which the judge at the next trial ought, in our opinion, to direct the jury to be governed by when the when they estimated the damages. It is, indeed, of the last importance that uh, we should do this for if the jury are left without any definitive rule to guide them, it will, in such cases as these, manifestly lead to the greatest injustice. The court's instructions in the law to the jury follow and should be noted carefully by all students of the law and particularly those seeking damages for breach of contract. Now, we think that the proper rule in such a case as the present is this, where two parties have made a contract which one of them has broken, the damages which the other party ought to receive in respect of such breach of contract should be such as may fairly and reasonably be considered either arising naturally, i.e. according to the usual course of things, from such breach of the contract itself, or such as may be reasonable, uh, reasonably be supported to have been, excuse me, in, in the contemplation of both parties at the time they made the contract as the probable result of the breach of it. Now, if the special circumstances under which the contract was actually made were uh, communicated by the plaintiff to the defendant and thus known to both parties, the damages resulting from the breach of 
such a contract, which they would reasonably contemplate, would be the amount of the injury which would ordinarily follow from the breach of the contract under these special circumstances so known and communicated. But, on the other hand, if these special circumstances were wholly unknown to the party breaking the contract, he, at the most, could only be supposed to have had in his contemplation the amount of injury which would arise generally, and, in the great multitude of the case, not affected by any special circumstances from such a, be a breach of a contract, for... Had the special circumstances been known, the parties might have specially provided for the breach of contract by special terms as to the damages in that case, and of this advantage, it would be very unjust to deprive them. In other words, damages resulting from breach of contract cannot arise from more than the obligation agreed to by the breaching party. Uh, Bexdale Bexendale didn't agree or consider that he'd be liable to Hadley for uh, lost profits while the uh, mill wheel shaft was repaired. He only undertook to repair it as quickly as was reasonable, reasonably within his power to do. And the court uh, decided in an opinion that uh, continues to be honored by courts today that damages for breach of the contract should only be those contemplated by the parties, i.e. damages for which they agreed in their contract to be liable uh, one to the other, not consequential or incidental damages. So, that being said, the essential elements in their uh, barest form follow. Elements. One, existence of an enforceable contract at law. Two, acts of the defendant that constitute his breach of the contract. And three, damages to the plaintiff resulting from the defendant's breach. As stated at the beginning of this book, merely listing the elements in this form exposes the complaint to a motion to dismiss because each element must be fleshed out with all facts necessary to establish el each element. Comments. When does a contract arise? What constitutes a contract? These two are questions that should be understood and answered by parties involved in a breach of contract case. It, in its simplest form, a contract arises whenever two parties exchange a promise. A contract is nothing more than a promise for a promise. There must, however, be a meeting of the minds in order for a contract to arise. For example, in the hypothetical case about the sale of a prize bull discussed earlier in this book, there was no meeting of the minds about the bull being dead or alive. The buyer reasonably believed the bull was still living. The seller knew the bull was dead. There was... Uh, there was, therefore, no meeting of the minds and no enforceable contract. If the seller had delivered the dead bull and demanded his 200, the buyer could refuse to pay without being uh, liable for breach of contract. There was no contract because there was no meeting of the minds. If Jones makes an offer and Smith accepts the offer before Jones withdraws the offer, a contract is formed between them. If their contract is enforceable at law, either can sue the other for breach of breach and recover damages within the contemplation of the parties. At the moment the offer is accepted, a contract is formed. Both are bound by their mutual promises. If Jones withdraws his offer before Smith accepts, no contract is formed. The law of offer and acceptance, when an offer is accepted, when an offer by mail can be accepted by telephone and such like issues is beyond the scope of this book. Defense. Abandonment. If the plaintiff has abandoned his contract with the defendant through some overt act, ergo pursuing uh, performance through a separate contract with another, the defendant may have an affirmative defense to breach of contract. As with all affirmative defenses, he should plead abandonment with the filing of, of his answer or by motion to dismiss. Act of God. I love this act of God one because this is what, uh, it's really funny. The state will issue deer permits, but by God, if you hit one of them freaking deer out of season or even in season, you know what they'll tell you? It was an act of God. Wait a minute. It was your deer during hunting season. You were charging a permit for it like you own the son of a bitch. Now all of a sudden you don't own it because it destroyed my property. And now you want to say it was an act of God and you're not liable for it. Hmm, we got some issues there, Skipper. Act of God. If hurricane, lightning, flood, or other unforeseeable and unpreventable effects of nature make performance of the contract impossible, there arises a defense to breach, as the defendant was unable to perform due to causes beyond his control. 
breach, uh, and that also there's a there's a a, a maximal uh, there's a maximum of law in equity about that as well, an impossibility. There is no uh, contractual obligation where there exists an uh, impossibility. And I'm paraphrasing, that's not exactly what it says, but it's similar. Breach by other party. If the plaintiff breaches first, ergo refuses to deliver or pay someone due, when there arises a defense to his uh, complaint that should result in a dismissal where there is only a partial breach, however, the defendant may be held liable for portions of the contract and damages to the plaintiff resulting therefrom. Duress. One compelled by force or threat of force to enter into a contract is relieved of liability to perform it. Okay, everybody talks about the Magna Carta. Ladies and gentlemen, the Magna Carta was created under threat and duress. Okay, uh, the lords held uh, swords to the man's throat and said, sign this son of a bitch. So is it a legitimate contract? I would say no. Such a contract is not deemed void. However, it is voidable if the defendant can prove he entered into it under duress. Failure of consideration. A plaintiff who has not paid all of the purchase price, for example, is not entitled to sue for delivery unless the contract contemplated that delivery would be tended before full payment received. Moreover, if a contract is unilateral promise without a uh, counter veiling promise in return, it is unenforceable ab initio from the beginning. For example, the promise of a purely gratuitous gift cannot be enforced since there is no consideration flowing from the other side. Remember, equity will not uh, uh, perfect an imperfect gift, all right? Fraud in the inducement. Like, contra like contracts obtained by duress, contracts obtained by fraud cannot be enforced. This defense is explained in detail later in this book. Like a cause of action, this defense has essential elements that must be pled and proved to prevail. Hindrance of performance. This defense is predicated on the common sense doctrine that one who hinders or prevents another from performing his contract should not be heard to sue on his contract. It's that simple. So basically, let's say you got contracted to do a plumbing job, you show up to do the job, but they've got the gate closed and padlocked. Uh, and you can't get in there without destroying their property, and then they try to sue you later for it, uh, they hindered your performance. They knew you were coming. You came in at the said time. You actually have a claim against them uh, because you showed up. You fulfilled your end of the bargain, tried to do the work, but they hindered you from entering in by having a locked gate, all right? So if they were to bring a claim against you for failing to perform, you would hammer them for uh, hindrance of performance as, as a defense and a counterclaim because they prevented you from doing what you said you were going to do when you showed up to execute the contract. You at least partially fulfilled your end of the obligation and showed intent to complete your end of the obligation. All right. Illegality. No contract that is in itself illegal or contemplates an illegal result can be enforced at law. This defense is an absolute bar to enforcement. Impossibility, a contract that cannot possibly be performed, like delivery of particular living prize bull that has died is not enforceable at law. However, any consideration given uh, for performance must be repaid, i.e. the parties must be put in the same position as they were in before entering their agreement to the extent it is possible to do so. That's equity. Equity sees that what should be done shall be done. Uh, equity imputes an intention to fulfill an obligation. Uh, and equity delights to do uh, equality and not by halves, okay? Mistake. A party may avoid the consequences of a contract if, after exercising due care, he can successfully prove he was uh, excusably mistaken in his understanding of its terms and obligations. Again, this is where I say, let ev let the other people make the contract, all right? If the contract is written vague and ambiguous, uh, you have a way out. If the contract is written uh, unconsciously, uh, or it's an unconsciousable contract that doesn't mutually benefit both parties involved, you have a way out, okay? I'm not saying don't be a man of your word, don't honor your word. What I'm saying is, if it's an unconsciousable contract, it's egregious and it's not fair, um, you have your way out. And even the Bible says that. You make a deal with the devil, you have to abide by it. You have to fulfill your obligation because you are to be a man of your word. Uh, all we have in this world, especially with the false and fictitious monetary system, is our word. Our word is our bond, right? The mistake must go to a material element of the contract and comprise a substantial part of the value bargained for. Therefore, if one promises to pay $6 million for the building on the corner of Maple and Elm, only to later discover the property being sold is 
is at a uh, mane and uh, chestnut, the court may excuse performance if the mistake is not the result of an inexcusable lack of due, due care or the other party has so determinedly relied on the contract that it would be inequitable to uh, deny enforcement. When we come back, we're going to be talking about breach of fiduciary duty. Again, this book, I don't know if you can find it online anymore. Uh, it's called A Cause of Action and Civil Defense. So when we come back, we're going to be talking about breach of fiduciary duty. So we're going to be talking about officers, judges, bailiffs, uh, senators, congressmen. All of them have a duty, all right? They've all entered into a trust. Remember, equity imputes an intention to fulfill an obligation, whether or not they're properly bonded or they actually took the proper oath makes no difference to me because equity imputes an intention to fulfill an obligation. And in Article 3, Subsection 2, Subpart 1 Court, I got their ass all day long. All right, so next we're going to be talking about breach of fiduciary duty. Thanks for joining me, and we'll see you here shortly.